Welcome and aloha. Thank you so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Wherever you may be, whether you're here in Hawaii or anywhere else, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it may be where you are. I hope it's a time that's good for you. And we have the really good fortune of having with us today Tina Patterson, who has just added to her many laurels of being selected as a council member for the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution, a leadership position for the largest dispute resolution group of the largest association of lawyers anywhere. And David Larson, the immediate past chair of the ABA dispute resolution section and a professor at Hamlin, Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul. And we've kind of devolved into today a topic that we've bounced around and skimmed off of a lot of times in our past discussions. But today we're just going to come right on and go there and talk about trauma, what it's like, how to deal with it, what are the resources and directions that may be of use. And I know, David, you've just experienced one. How is that still impacting you? Well, we're it's very recent. Um, a week ago Friday, we had a, a home invasion where um, events began that somebody that was clearly troubled, um, I don't know if it was methamphetamines or something, had this person very agitated um, and very violent. Um, at 10.30 p.m. at night, started banging on the back of our house, shouting, let me in, let me in. And apparently this person had been going around the neighborhood and police had been called. So just as he was getting to our house, police were arriving, which is good. Um, uh, we, of course, didn't answer the back and he circled around to the front and uh, he started pounding on the front door. And we had looked out the back and saw the police had arrived. And when he got to the front door, he's just banging at it and he shouts, it's the police. And uh, so we thought it was the police that <laughs> come from the backyard. And we opened the door, like there he is, like a, one foot away from us. And I just slammed the door shut immediately. And uh, and he's just pounding on the door, you know, let me in, let me in, let me in. And uh, the police tried to talk him down for a while and uh, it wasn't working. So they started yelling taser, taser, taser. And we heard the tasers, the clicking. And uh, and he was tased and it did nothing. And it, he just pulled the, the, the tags out and um, at that point picked up a lawn chair and uh, and threw it through our window. And we were standing about five feet away. And, uh, and as soon as he threw the chair through the window, he followed it through and came into our house. Uh, immediately afterwards, one of the officers that was there followed him in you know, and tackled and got on top of him, but couldn't restrain him. We were able to get to the front door, which is only another 10 feet away, let the second officer in. And uh, that person was having trouble, the two of them restraining them. And uh, we had 911 on the phone. They're saying more squad cars are coming. And uh, eventually 14 squad cars came. Uh, 20 police officers were in our house. Um, before they arrived, it was a, like a movie brawl in our house. They were fighting. Uh, we've got a lot of interior damage that we're gonna have to have repaired. Initial estimates are $23,000, it might even be more. So we're gonna have to kind of live through all those repairs. Um, but the good thing is that uh, this person wasn't able to get to us physically. So it's property damage, things that can be repaired, but thank God it isn't personal injury. And uh, we're really grateful for that. Wow. So glad that neither of you were hurt. How long did it take for the police to finally really subdue him? It took a long time. Um, uh, the two officers, they could kind of hold them down, but they weren't subduing them. And they're fighting for this, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. It wasn't until more police officers came that they were able really to, to restrain him. And even then, they were probably on the floor for another 15 minutes trying to calm him down. You know, they, they, they called uh, mental health professionals. And eventually, um, 
took him out on a, uh, they, they walked him out, but then put him on a stretcher, took him to the hospital. Um, when he got to the hospital, he immediately started attacking the staff, the hospital. So he assaulted um, staff at the hospital too. So you know, five, five counts in a criminal complaint or as a protection, um, you know, there'll be victim impact statements. So there's much more to happen still. Wow. Tina, what kind of questions does this raise in your mind? Um, maybe that I can relate. Um, it, it raises several questions and it also brings to mind a couple of things based on my training. The fact, so the chasers um, would generally bring an adult down unless that adult is in an agitated state and that agitated state could be because of drugs or other things that they've ingested. Um, it's unsettling to hear that um, the officers could, were unable to subdue him, which kind of makes me think again about him being on drugs or being on, on some type of substance that really just hyped up his adrenal system. Um, I, I guess the questions that come to mind are, how do you, you know, how do you feel? How, how do you, for most of us, our, our home is our, our haven. It's our safe space. And when someone unwanted enters our space and destroys our space, there's, there's disequilibrium. Um, and so the question that comes to mind is how do you get that equilibrium again? And what does it take? Um, and I, I'll, I'll just say again, I can relate. Someone vandalized my property recently, so I completely relate to it. Um, but but it, 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 so those are the questions that come to mind. Yeah, you know, okay. I've always been kind of a glass half full guy. So even though we had some significant damage, it's he didn't get to us, didn't didn't physically harm us. So that's that's kind of the I think that's what's sustaining us right now. That we can say that, okay, this other stuff can be repaired. Um, it's gonna be problematic, it's gonna take time, but thank God that that we're okay. Um, we're okay physically. So in the short term, that's I think how we're looking at that. Um, you know, both my wife and I grew up in a town that fairly high crime town. There was a fair amount of violence um, in the 1960s. We had a mayor, Bob Sabanjan, who made national headlines when there was racial conflict, and he ordered the National Guard to shoot on sight. <laughs> It was that kind of a place. And um, so this is not something we haven't been aware of. In the community we grew up in, there was a certain amount of violence. It wasn't quite as immediate as this, five feet away, um, but it was happening around us. So we were aware of it. And I think that gives us a little bit of a context that this isn't something that doesn't happen. That being said, it was so incredible to have this crash and a chair fly through the window and a person coming through the window that it's almost not real this this can't be real this didn't really happen it's too surreal so i think that's a little bit of a too it's so unimaginable that i don't know maybe it just hasn't settled in completely yet um maybe hopefully it never will it'll just be something that this is so unbelievable um it could never happen again i don't know that it would and i hope it wouldn't but I think that's where we are right now. It just was such an unbelievable occurrence that it's hard to believe it's real. So what are the most stabilizing elements, forces for you folks now? Well, I mean, certain confidence that the, you know, we can talk about policing a lot, and we are talking about policing a lot, and we need to talk about policing a lot. You know, we're in a period where we are looking at past behaviors and uh, understanding that we need reform, and we need reform on different levels. And I'm pleased to say that I believe that's happening in the Twin Cities right now, that we are making progress in that direction. Um, but 
I am glad that we do have police because if they had not been there following this person in through our broken window, I don't know what, what would have happened. Um, so the fact that I take comfort in the fact that we still do have for situations of immediate violence, that we still have um, law enforcement authorities that, that can and will intervene because it certainly made a difference in, in our situation. And those are important things to understand because we know there are lots of neighborhoods where having police on the scene and in contact even before the intrusion is a far cry from their reality. Yeah, we're just lucky. I, you know, the, the, we weren't the first house approached. Um, had there not been a call already in, I mean, I don't know what time elapsed between the initial call, because I don't even know who made it, and the time when they showed up. So it's just serendipitous. It's just coincidental that they were showing up right when he was arriving at our house. Um, I, I, I like to think, and I will assume, that they answered pretty quickly. And I will say that when the latter calls came in for, for much assistance, police did show up quickly at that point. But at that point, it was pretty clear that things had gotten pretty bad and we needed assistance ASAP, but, but they did respond quickly. So Tina, you indicated that you've known people who have gone through <laughs> traumatic violence. What in your experience has helped them the most to recover from that, if they did? A sense of community. Um, those someone or some, uh, groups of individuals that they can talk to um, and listen um, without judgment, without pointing fingers or blame, um, and allow that person to go through the gamut of emotions, whether it's feeling guilty or feeling uncomfortable or feeling scared, um, and being able to express that and knowing that it stuffing it down is, is not the best and it, because it will manifest in other ways, whether it's insomnia or overeating or other behaviors. Um, those, are, those are some of the ways. Talking to a, a counselor, I think one of the, the things that COVID has really brought to bear, um, and it's talked about a little bit, I, I would hope that it will be talked about more, is the access to counseling online, whether it's through the various organizations that are offering counseling for free, or if you want to talk to um, someone in the faith community, that's also another option. But knowing that someone, that there's someone you can talk to. I have been, it's funny, this topic is, we're discussing this tonight because I have been recently um, listening to um, Mia Birdsong's book, How We Show Up. And it's about trauma. Part of it is about trauma. And, and having that sense of community, that sense of connection, and what happens when we, we feel that we are we're traumatized, whether it's past trauma that is repeating itself and showing up in our lives, or it's a, a recent trauma that's triggered something else, and, and how to, to, to be able to not always come to peace, but at least be able to navigate and be able to, to be functional versus um, struggling to, to do basic things, get out of bed, um, dress, interact with others. Um, and also moving away from, I have to keep it to myself. Um, I'll share this because I, I was talking with a colleague about this the other day, and it was in the context of when, when we are in a situation that makes us either feel uncomfortable or vulnerable, um, especially in the African-American community, concept of getting um, support, mental health support, is not generally looked highly upon. It's something that only white people do. Oh, white people do that. You should just pray about it. Or, you know, you, you just, you, we don't need to tell others. And we see this in, in other communities as well. You don't tell strangers. Sometimes we need to tell a stranger because that family member, that, that person that we normally talk to is too close and is not going to just listen. And sometimes that's what, what we really need when we're in this space. We need someone to just listen and say, it's going to be okay. 
And that's a really valuable insight because I know here in Hawaii, where we have a very large Asian Pacific population, there is a stereotypical resistance to being available to or contacting support services after trauma, no matter how much it's needed, whether physical or emotional, or the, the worse the physical, the more the emotional kicks in. And that can be a really, really hard thing to find people in the family who can help convince that person and go with that person to do that. But that's yeah, Tina, a huge first step. Yeah, David. I was saying Tina mentioned, you know, that community is really helpful. So there was no way this was going to not be unnoticed with 14 squad cars outside our house with the lights flashing. People knew something was going on. Um, but our neighbors came over right away and uh, there was a lot of blood around. You know, this, they were fighting and bleeding. They came through broken windows and got cut up. So now it's, you know, now it's like 1130 at night on a Friday. We got damage and blood. You know, if we had just been alone, kind of just looking at that and thinking, oh, man, what are we going to do now? Um, that would have really been tough. But um, our neighbor uh, came over with rubber gloves and a bucket and, um, you know, and uh, began using soap and water and started cleaning up the blood. I don't know if this is biohazard protocol. She had a big jug of Mr. Clean. So that's that's how we sanitized and crossed my fingers that that was good enough. But I think it was. So, but to have that person show up and kind of take that off our shoulders, that immediate cleanup, and it was like broken glass everywhere to, you know, to help clean up the, the real immediate things, getting rid of the blood and the and the broken glass was tremendously helpful. Um, and uh, and the police department does have a contract with a with a restoration company, so they were able to come over and just and board up windows and things like that. So uh, having someone to assist us in the immediacy was tremendously helpful. That you know we just weren't left there staring at it and trying to figure out what do we do next. So that idea of having a community and it can be a community on a social friendship level could be a you know a a government entity, professional association, but having a community as opposed to no community is really essential. Just that restoration of connectedness when you felt most vulnerable, most at risk, can be an extremely big part of opening a door to healing and willingness to engage in healing. And so let's ask maybe a somewhat harder question. This may be an example of how the response or responses overall and over time were, if not ideal, they were, they were pretty good. But we see lots of examples in our society of where we're falling way short. Where to, to your way of thinking, are the worst of those. Tina? I'm not sure I follow the question. So can you expand a little bit more? Yeah, where, where are we falling short of providing that support, that reconnection, that opportunity for help and healing? Um, I think sometimes it is in the time that we expect the healing to occur. Um, we are, everything is speedy, everything is fast, nanoseconds. And it, this is an instance where we can't measure. We can't measure what, what that trauma is going to look like. Um, I'll share something that happened to me. I mentioned my property being vandalized a couple of weeks ago. I don't know who vandalized it. I came home and found that um, part of my property had been damaged. Um, it was a mat. It's a matter of there isn't a community. Um, no one has said anything. Everyone's quiet. I, I got a police report, but I thought you know I took pictures. I I contacted my insurance company. Um, people have people who know me have said, oh, let me know if you need something, and then moved on. 
in the meantime, I'm navigating trying to find someone to repair this work. Um, and what it's turned into is, and I'm sharing this because this is how it can manifest. I thought everything was okay until I started realizing I'm not sleeping at night. And you know, the first night I thought, oh, you know, you're just a little antsy. Well, now it's repeated. And I realize it's that sense of, I don't feel safe. Um, if this can happen, what else could happen? And what steps can I take? And it's that it's it's literally it took me saying, what can I what can I take control of in this situation? Um, because I'm I'm not, you know, I'm I'm navigating this maze of insurance company contractors trying to get all of this sorted out. And it's it feels a bit overwhelming. And it, it it's supposed to be, and I had a friend who texted me the other day. So is every everything fixed yet? And I was like, I would love to say yes, but the answer is no, it's not. And until it's fixed, this still hovers over. So I think that's where we go wrong and thinking it's a quick fix. It's going to be immediate, and you know, it's it's it could take time, and it, something may happen down the road that makes that person think of that event or or what, what transpired. So I, I think not trying to say, not trying to say there's a time period in which you are supposed to no longer be experiencing the trauma because it, it, can, cre it can creep up, it can pop up, it can show up in any number of ways. And I don't wanna sound um, doom and gloom, but I do wanna talk about the realities of, of, of how it can appear. Um, you know, that person who was suddenly, and I talked with a client recently, she, in the course of a, a two hour conversation, must have smoked at least five cigarettes and probably four or five cups of coffee. And I said, this is wearing on you. Um, and, and this is how it's manifesting itself. Hey, and I think that's a really important point to remember is that while the immediate situational physical effects may be things that can be dealt with in the physical, the mental, emotional effects and situations that can trigger the flashbacks, the recurrences, that feeling again. I mean, for example, if you were walk, to walk into your home, it could be weeks later, it could be months later, and something about it just doesn't look or feel right the chance that that same experience, that same fear, that same feeling of violation might come back is right there. And you're right, those are things that we don't pay attention to, we don't deal with. Um, I think sometimes we, we wanna rush through it and um, we wanna rush through it and, oh, it's been a week, everything should be okay. It's been two weeks, everything's gonna be okay. Versus, you know, how, just asking, how are you? How are you feeling? Um, you know, when we think about people who have been the survivors of violent acts that have been perpetrated against them, sometimes it's months and years before there's a sense of wholeness again. And, and it's literally bringing back those pieces of yourself to feel whole again, or feeling like you have some type of control. And giving the person space to say, you know what, I don't like going out at night um, by myself, or I don't like, I, I don't like walking in the park early in the morning um, and not, not attaching a stigma or, or uh, um, prejudging the person because that's where they are. We don't know what has brought them to that point. And this is the coping mechanism that they're using to navigate. And I think we, we've always been a little better at treating physical injuries, you know, anatomical, yes. um, because it's more objective. We can kind of map it out and figure out what's wrong. When it comes to mental in, uh, mental impairments, mental injuries, mental health, it remains a little more mysterious, a little more elusive. And um, people react very differently. There isn't just, you know, you fracture your arm, there's pretty much one way to fix it. 
um, someone is subjected to trauma, you're going to get different kinds of reactions with different people. And it's and it becomes a lot harder to try and treat that and diagnose that. So I think that that's one of the remaining challenges we're living through right now. I don't know if there's a silver lining to COVID, but um, one thing that happened in COVID is that um, our lives are really seriously impacted and we're living them differently. We're living them more in isolation. And we've begun talking about mental health in ways that I don't think we've ever had in my lifetime um, and thinking more critically about it, paying more attention to it. That's that's good. And I think that we will get better at mental health and that can have all kinds of helpful impacts. And going back to policing you know, a lot of times and thinking about what happened at our home, that was a troubled person. And um, you know they tried to talk this person down. There was no way to do it. It's happening too fast. But if, there, if somebody could have gotten to this person at an earlier date and time than the day this happened, maybe there could have been an intervention that would have prevented it from ever happening in the first place. So when we think about our policing, um, I was never a fan of the, of the mantra, defund the police. And I never thought a lot of people saying that were really say defund the police. I think there, at least many people I know are saying, fix the police, amend the police, supplement the police. It's not that we don't need law enforcement, but we need something else. We need more. And, um, and I think that we're in the midst of that discussion, that what other kinds of services and interventions do we need to, to make available to, to make our environment a safer place? And that's a great insight because it's pretty hard to think of a police department or duty officers anywhere who have any significant amount of training in mental emotional health issues and how to deal with those in people. And a lot of these, whether it's Uvalde or Parkland or anywhere else, those are central. And there's another question that comes up relatedly. For the people who are subjected to this, who experience this, is there a difference for those people between severe accidental harm, the wildfires, the floods, the hurricanes, tornadoes, and the personal violent harm? What's your thought? Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, you know, a lot, I think, depends on the person, because I'm thinking about Kentucky now and, uh, you know, the devastation that some people have experienced. And there are people that don't have homeowners insurance or they're uninsurable because they live in a floodplain. You know, they've been just completely devastated. They've lost everything they own. So even though it's very different than a personal assault, I don't know how they recover from that or if they ever will. Um, they probably will go on. But I don't know if they'll ever feel like they've reclaimed what they've lost. So, you know, I, I have a difficult time comparing apples and oranges a little bit, saying one is worse than the other. Um, I'm not sure I can do that. I agree with David. I'm not sure I can do that. And I, I think on some level, um, whether it's physical or because of external force, in this case, we're talking about a natural disaster, the trauma, it's, the, it, it's how that trauma appears, where that trauma rests, whether it rests in the body or in the mind or a combination. I, I don't think you can say one is greater than the other, it's trauma. Um, and it's, it's how that trauma is addressed um, how that trauma is triaged is 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 critical. Um, I agree with you, David. I don't think I, I don't think you can you can say one is one is worse or one is less worse than the other. They're both they're both difficult. Um, you know, they're both going to generate the sleepless nights. They're both going to have the person experiencing sorrow and going through stages of grief because of some loss, whether it's loss of innocence or loss of property, loss of a loved one loss of that sense of community, loss of that sense of um, feeling stable, back to the equilibrium, you know, the, the equilibrium is gone and, and now you're, you're out there, um, you know, you're, you're vulnerable. And you hear the, you hear the noise outside your home and you've had a home invasion or some kind of trauma in your home. 
that certainly will bring back flashbacks and fear. But if you've suffered the kind of flooding they've suffered in Kentucky and people have, have died and you hear that big thunderclap, um, you hear the storm coming, the winds coming up, um, that's going to be terrifying also. Yeah, and we know also that in many natural disasters, people lose loved ones. So trying to draw a distinction between the mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical effects of those doesn't make any sense. What we're falling short on our mental, emotional health resources for those people. And, and I'm sure we also would all appreciate those who have the least physically to lose, it may cost them the most because they have nothing left to recover with physically. And that has a mental, emotional impact as well. So David, Tina, thank you so much for talking about tough stuff and vulnerable experiences that we all have. Thanks for your thoughtfulness, for your insight. Be well, have a great weekend, and take care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.